The Librarian of Congress made a great choice selecting Daniel Allen, the 12th recipient of the Kluge Prize. Dr. Allen is a perfect example of what the Kluge Center was established to do, to make a connection between thought, scholarly pursuits, and action. I grew up in a very political family with people from all sides of the political spectrum involved. My dad um, participated prominently in the Reagan administration. Um, my aunt ran for office in California under the Peace and Freedom Party banner, and the clashes among them were defining conversational spaces in my childhood. She wrote the book, Our Declaration, which is really uh, this wonderful exegesis of the Declaration of Independence, but you can pick it up and read it. And you don't have to have a PhD in political science to take something extraordinarily meaningful away from it. The Declaration is a fundamentally human document. It emerges from a group of people looking around their world, diagnosing their circumstances, when in the course of human events, it says, they find their world wanting they call it out in its imperfections in the list of grievances and complaints against King George, and they lay out an alternative, a vision for how they could organize their world better together. That is the core of every human motivation to live in a better world. I think I reached out for one column and it was great, and so then we did another column and realized that Danielle Allen is a national treasure and she could be a treasure to our readers also. like the violence that's perpetuated by the police or the things that happen in our in our court systems that are that are racially uh, unjust that there has to be ways that we together as a coalition fight those things and I think that Danielle Allen epitomizes um, our investment in that kind of work. My baby cousin Michael, somebody I grew up with, went to prison at the age of 15 on a first arrest for an attempted carjacking. He was received a 13-year sentence, 12 years, eight months, served 11 years, and three years after his release, um, he was killed by somebody he'd met in prison. So that first arrest turned out to be the journey to the end of his life. Daniel Allen is a natural. She is just a very good writer and a very good storyteller. Danielle is just not afraid to work across fields in order to solve big problems. She's having an impact on American democracy and how we think about democracy in, the, in America and indeed the world. I can't think of a uh, better role model for, for um, students and, and our children. At the Library of Congress, we can help restore, replenish, rejuvenate the intellectual springs that sustain a healthy constitutional democracy and civic bonds within our community. Dr. Hayden, scholars, and our many other distinguished guests. I'm John Haskell, director of the John W. Kluge Center. On behalf of the Library of Congress, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the conferral of the 2020 Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. All of us at the library are deeply touched that in these pandemic times, you saw fit to come out and attend what is a very special ceremony honoring a very special person. Dr. Allen, Dr. Hayden, this has been a long time coming. This event is being recorded for placement on the library's website 
and it is being live streamed, so I welcome all of our viewers around the world. The John W. Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity is unique among international awards. The prize covers a wide range of scholarly fields, including virtually all of the humanities and social sciences. It honors scholars who, over a sustained period, have distilled wisdom from the cumulative record of human experience, shaped public life, and conveyed their work to a broader audience. The selection process is wide-ranging and democratic. The library solicits nominations from hundreds of national and international institutions and individuals. And we use a rigorous selection process involving curators, specialists, and a distinguished panel of outside scholars. We are deeply grateful to the late John W. Kluge for his generosity in creating the endowment that funds this prize, as well as the research of the vet, many visiting scholars at the Kluge Center here within the Thomas Jefferson Building. Many current and former Kluge scholars are here with us tonight. Now, most significantly, here in the Jefferson Building, in this institutional symbol of the importance of knowledge to our democracy, we thank the Congress of the United States for creating the Library of Congress and sustaining it for over two centuries, beginning with Jefferson's amazing collection, which has grown to more than 170 million items today. And now, the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, will confer the 2020 Kluge Prize. Scholars, colleagues, friends, and distinguished guests, I too am so pleased you are here with us this evening. Welcome to the Library of Congress in person. Before I move on to the award presentation, I'd like to share a bit more of the history of the prize that John didn't mention. My predecessor, the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, had the vision to create this prize, as well as the Kluge Center and worked alongside John W. Kluge to turn this dream into a reality. Scholars of tremendous stature whose work and career had a profound effect and impact on civil society across the globe. John Hope Franklin, Fernando Henrique Cardoza, and several others received the prize from Dr. Billington. Most recently, in 2018, Drew Gilpin Faust received this coveted honor. And today, tonight, it is my great privilege to confer the Kluge Prize on our laureate, Dr. Danielle Allen. I have more. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to say some more about you. <laughs> your parents are here, your family is here, so I'm going to say more because Daniel Allen, the James Conant Bryant Professor at Harvard University, is regarded as the one and one of the leading political theorists of our time. She studied classics at Princeton, graduating summa cum laude, she earned Master's of Philosophy and PhD degrees of classics from King College, University of Cambridge, and an AM and PhD degrees in government from Harvard University. As you could see in the opening video, Dr. Allen is the author of our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality an analysis that reinvigorates public understanding of the founding document of the United States. She is also a 2001 MacArthur Genius Grant <laughs> recipient for her ability to combine, and I quote, the classicist's careful attention to text and language with the political theorist's sophisticated and informed engagement. In my mind, what sets Danielle apart and what makes her uniquely qualified for this award is her ability to bridge the gap between rigorous scholarship, even classical scholarship, 
and the real world issues and problems, all in a way that reaches all age groups and well beyond the academic professions. This year, she collaborated with the library on an initiative she designed titled Our Common Purpose, a campaign for civic strength at the Library of Congress. It included programs looking at the promise of civic media, reform in our political institutions, and the search for shared narratives of American history. These programs brought leading scholars and practitioners to the library via virtual space to engage these issues. And in tandem with these events, Danielle led workshops with teachers across the country in efforts to promote civic engagement from K through 12. As she said, civic education is our common purpose. Now this initiative hardly scratches the surface of what she has done on justice, citizenship, and democracy. She was the principal investigator of the Democratic Knowledge Project, a K through 12 educational reform platform she designed to identify and disseminate the knowledge that and capacities required for democratic citizenship. She was also co-chair of a bipartisan commission convened by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which recently recommended 31 steps to strengthen American institutions and civic culture to help a nation in crisis emerge with a more resilient democracy. And last year, she engaged with scholars across many disciplines in the urgent work required to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Roadmap to Pandemic Resilience was a one-of-a-kind document bringing scholarship to bear on scientific and policy challenges we all faced and will continue to face. Dr. Daniel Allen is nothing short of a model for scholars in all fields, exemplified by deep research together with the connection to challenges facing democracies. And I might add emphatically, she has the courage to engage fully with policymakers, opinion leaders, and the public. Dr. Allen, it is my honor to present you with the Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. And now we will hear from our laureate. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayden. I really have been blown away by this honor. And it's been an extraordinary thing to work with you and all of your colleagues. I also just want to thank John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center, whose tenacity across this past year and a half has been remarkable. Who would have thought when you were working toward this award and announcement of it that the conditions would be what they were? And yet, the full raft of programming continued, unreduced by in any dimension, different in form and kind, but complete. And here we are now, as I understand it, with the first in-person gathering for the library again under your direction and leadership. So first of all, just thank you to all the library staff who've made it possible for us to gather together tonight. It's a big deal, and I know I've been hearing stories all day of people wandering through the halls of the library and saying, is that you? You know, you're, you're taller or shorter or this or that or than, uh, than I remembered, or then when I saw you on Zoom and the hair and the everything has changed, and oh, the hair in that video, we will always have a memory of pandemic times, <laughs> lack of a haircut for months on end, not attractive, but that's all right. <laughs> So I also want to thank the archivist of the U.S., David Ferriero, for joining us tonight. It's an honor to have you here. 
Again, tremendous leadership, keeping presidential libraries around the country open. And you are the stewards of our treasures. We owe you all a great debt. It is a huge honor to receive this award, and one that caught me completely by surprise when it arrived. I wanted to take a few moments this evening to talk about work that's very dear to my heart, the project of educating for American democracy. I'm gonna focus on this theme despite the temptation to talk about everything because it's a prize for a study of humanity. I'm gonna keep it just to America. We'll keep it small. And then there's the other issue. I've been given about 15 minutes, but I have been waiting for about a year to make these remarks. So I'll do my best. But educating for American democracy, we might also think of that as the question of how we handle our family inheritance, good and bad. In my family, my parents always said to me, and I'm very grateful that they're here tonight, that my only inheritance would be my education. I was pretty greedy, so you can see on that list, a couple master's degrees, a couple PhDs. I wanted as much of that inheritance as I could possibly put my hands on. But the inheritance wasn't just the formal part of the education. My mother spent unnumbered hours pulling boxes out of her closet and plopping them on the dining room table and rifling through photos and old letters and making sure I knew about the Johnsons in Minnesota who were from Sweden and the Ayers folks who were from Scotland and England in various ways and then the McCall family who for who knows what they were called because they came through Ellis Island and became McCalls having come from someplace in Eastern Europe and came to Michigan to work in auto factories and then my dad made sure that I knew about my great, great grandfather, I lose track of the number of greats, it might be three that they're supposed to be, Sidifus, who came from the Caribbean as a free person shortly before the Civil War. He came in answer to a call for employment, but arrived and found himself duped, tricked into a job that was actually enslavement. It was a few years before the Civil War, so freedom came not long thereafter. But then there are many other tales of the family that spread over time and a family graveyard to help make note of those stories and know who was where when, who died peacefully, who died tragically, how do we understand how the story fits together. So there was that family education, as the Chinese would call it, alongside the formal education that my parents made clear to me was my inheritance. But the family education was just a piece then of a broader kind of education, a civic education that they also steered me toward. There was the civic education that came from the simple fact that my father was deeply involved in the work of the Bicentennial Commission. And so we had countless dinners at home that were about exactly how the anniversary of the Constitution should be celebrated, the 200th anniversary. So that imprints itself upon you without any doubt. But there was also the question of how to make sure stories that had been lost or not yet visible were fully integrated in the story of American history. In high school, when Black History Month rolled around, there wasn't any programming of any particular kind. So my father encouraged me to take that responsibility on myself to reach out to the school administration and ask, could I perhaps present some materials around black history? Could I add this to the curriculum? Could I make it a part of what we are learning? And the school administrators were indulging. They granted me space, a bulletin board. It was the last bulletin board in the most remote part of the campus, only because that was the last thing that was available, not out of any ill intent, but it was in a remote corner of the school. So we were only getting partway to where we wanted to be. And I filled that bulletin board with stories of people like Frederick Douglass and Mary McLeod Bethune and others who taught and led and educated and drove change in history. The history recognized the patterns of oppression and domination in our country, but also their overcoming. And I understood it was my job to claim my own civic education by forging that complete narrative, making it available also to my fellow students. Every society across the globe, oh, I did it, the globe, the study of humanity, has always considered it a fundamental responsibility to pass on a way of life. A healthy society succeeds in transferring its way of life from one generation 
to the next. And a civic education ultimately is just that work of passing on a family inheritance, the good and the bad. We had to wrestle in my family with a grandmother of mine who was unkind in her words and unkind in her actions, and I needed to understand where did that come from and why and what to do about it. So we wrestled together to put the pieces of the family story together and understand fully. This matters because to go anywhere, you need to know where you're starting from. So the project of passing on our family inheritance, of wrestling with who we are and what we are now, is about making sure we know what our starting point is. And then we also have to wrestle about where it is we want to go together as a family or as a people. But the question then of how to get to where we may want to go, we can answer only if we know where we're starting from. So that work of civic education of family inheritance, inheritance is fundamental to a society being able to move forward together. Though this is such an important project for every society on the globe, in this country we have lost track of how to complete this work. This comes out most starkly in a very basic spare data point from a few years ago. For the generation of Americans born before World War II, roughly 70% consider it essential to live in a democracy. For millennials, people age 40 and under, it's a different number. I don't know if you know, what percentage of millennials consider it essential to live in a democracy? Not quite 30%, okay? You can't have a democracy if people don't want a democracy. So if we have failed for rising generations to develop in them a commitment to the view that a constitutional democracy is necessary to them, an essential value to them, we've already lost it. So we have a pretty profound work to do to change the direction on that. I want to say something about the work that we can do, and that will bring me back to the Educating for American Democracy work that a cadre of us around the country have been working on. But I want to say first two more things about how it is we've come to this point where we are not bringing rising generations along into the project of understanding and sharing that commitment to constitutional democracy. These are two stories of unintended consequences. The first is a story about war. The second is a story about Congress. You might think that sounds like the same thing, but no, two different stories, okay? So the story about war goes back to World War II. We needed to beat the Germans at getting to an atom bomb. We had to get that done faster than Germany was going to do. Somebody named James Bryant Conant, then president of Harvard, led the Manhattan Project, a very serious research enterprise that brought universities into close connection with our government in order to build the resources for fighting the war. That led to serious investments in the STEM components of universities. And that effort to invest in STEM for the sake of national security was followed again decade after decade. When the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, Eisenhower responded by arguing that we needed more investments in technology, more investments in STEM education, and that part of our university system grew again. In the 1980s, when we were worried about competition from Japan, economic competition, the same dynamic played out. So for decades, we have been pursuing our national security, both security in the international sense and in the economic sense, by pursuing investments in technological or STEM education. And alongside that, letting investments in civic education fall by the wayside. The result is we're at a point now where, as a country, we spend about $50 of federal monies per kid every year on STEM education and five cents per kid every year on civic education. So I always say, you get what you pay for, all right? And so that, in the first instance, is a story of unintended consequences that we need to see. We have not invested in history education, social studies, the core elements of civic education. But there's another unintended consequence that we should pay attention to. The first story I just told is about the role of educated, education, educators in delivering civic education. But at the end of the day, educators are only the second line of defense for civic education, the second in the row of duty, the line of duty for delivering civic education. Those who stand first in the line of duty for delivering civic education are members of Congress. 
What do I mean in saying that? I'm going back here to Federalist 10, to James Madison's argument about what it takes to have a healthy, self-governing society. In a free society, if free self-governing equals, there will always be disputes and disagreements. That's the beauty and joy of liberty, that people should think differently from one another. And they were concerned about factionalism. They were concerned about tribalism, just as we are, and sought a design in their institutions that would give them a solution, a protection against the dangers of faction in their vocabulary. You know the story that Federalist 10 lays out, the design, the solution. Typically, though, we only focus on half of that solution. Right? The part we tend to focus on is that representation itself was the solution to the problem of faction. That representatives would be elected, they would have the job of synthesizing information and mediating opinion and generating a common view, taking confusion and chaos and turning it into something that makes sense and could be the basis for sound policy for a society, for a common purpose. But they were to be assisted by something else. They were to be assisted by literally nothing fancier than the extent of the country, the geographical spread of the country. How was this supposed to help them? It was supposed to make it hard for people with really extreme opinions to find each other and organize. The entire structure of our representative system was based on the idea that the only way people would be able to really get their opinions into the public sphere and process them and turn them into usable knowledge would be through representatives. So when Facebook, in 2005, gave us a technology that permits anybody anywhere to coordinate with anybody else, they knocked that pillar out from under our constitutional design. It is no longer the case that people have to go through representatives in order to get their opinions into public space, into decision making. No longer the case that they need representatives in order to coordinate action. And as a result, our representatives can't do their job as our nation's most important civic educators. Right? So that is a very significant unintended consequence of the arrival of Facebook. So what's to be done when we have not permitted our educators to educate for civic education and we have disabled our Congress from fulfilling its role as civic educators? What's to be done? There are 31 recommendations in the Our Common Purpose Report. You call it 31 steps, so it made me think it's like a 10-step program, except it's 31 because that's how bad the problem is. So, but anyway, I'm not going to talk about all those 31 steps right now. I'm just going to talk about what a small band of patriots has done and ask for your support of this work. The band of patriots I'm talking about is a group of 300 educators and scholars from across the country and across party lines who formed the Educating for American Democracy Initiative. I want to ask my colleague Louise Dubay from iCivics to stand up for a second and be recognized. because she has been an extraordinary leader of this fearless band. And we began in the summer of, I believe, 2018, am I getting that right? With support from NEH and the US Department of Education. And our project was to produce a roadmap that would show the path to restoring excellence in history and civic learning for all learners K through 12 across the country. What is in this roadmap? This group of 300 of us wrestled together over the question of our family inheritance. We started off small, six people. We wanted diversity, we wanted to expand. Every time we grew, we added diversity, geographic diversity, viewpoint diversity, background diversity, the whole range. So we, we got to 300. We are a crazy, incredible group of people. And we wrestled. The very first thing we wrestled over was, what exactly were we educating for? Was it a republic or a democracy? And you'll recognize this debate that people have. We compromised on constitutional democracy. I won't fill you in on the details there, but just point you to that compromise. And then we wrestled over the question of how we take the bad in our history, the ills of enslavement and racism and the like, and the good of it, the invention of constitutional democracy, the invention of structures of rights and rights protections. How do we tell those stories together? And we were clear that what we wanted to enable for young people was to do what I've just done with you tonight. 
Invite young people to tell their own stories. Bring their family stories into the national story. Let the national story be full of all family stories, the incredible complexity of what we have. And let them also then connect those family stories to something shared. Let them look at the question of constitutional democracy and answer the question of how they can come to share it, how they would design it for achieving the work of common purpose going forward. Give them the space for that reflective engagement, critical inquiry, as they seek to understand, again, both the good and the bad in our history. This roadmap is now being used by educators all over the country. States are looking into using it. We, the band of 300 patriots, are keeping our heads down, trying to avoid the partisan crossfire. Because our belief is, if we can just form a big enough group of people linking arms, committed to wrestling through the meaning of our inheritance together, we can hold the center. So the group of 300 patriots who have worked on the Educating for American Democracy roadmap is trying for you to hold the center. So I ask you, truly, and seriously, to take a look at it on the website and consider how you can lift up the work there in your states, in your cities, around the country. Link arms with us, please. It will take all of us literally linking arms, ready to wrestle together, and ignoring the crossfire. Thank you. I think everybody understands why Dr. Hayden thought it would be a good idea to have Danielle win the 2020 Kluge Prize. Um, it was a she mentioned the work she did with the library. Uh, we spent a lot of time on Zoom, Leanne Potter at the library, myself and others, uh, and working with Louise and others. And uh, it was a great pleasure and it was a great step forward. The library is already building on the things uh, that, that Danielle did here with other programming. And we're very excited about that. Um, this concludes our ceremony. I want to thank you again, Danielle, and we look forward to working with, with you in the future.